Welcome everybody uh, to, as we continue this examination of the word of God, uh, the Bible tells us all scripture is God breed. It is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that a man of God might be matured and furnished unto all good works. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman who need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Turn with me to the word of truth as we continue our study in Revelation. Revelation chapter 13, verses 11 through 18. Revelation 13, verses 11 through 18. And I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon, and he exercises all the authority of the first beast in the presence, in his presence, and he makes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast, whose fatal wound was healed. And he performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down out of heaven to the earth in the presence of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs which it was given him to perform in the presence of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who had wound of the sword and has come to life. And there was given to him to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast might even speak and cause as many as do not worship the image of the beast to be killed. And he causes all, the small and the great and the rich and the poor and the free men and the slaves to be given a mark on their right hand or on their forehead. And he provides that no one should be able to buy or to sell except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for the number is that of a man, and his number is 666. Let's bow our heads as we ask God to bless our time together. Holy God, here we are again to worship you, to study your word. We cannot thank you enough for the many blessings that you have lavished upon us, totally undeserving. And for the fact that you have allowed us to remain in the land of the living while you have called a good number of, a good number of people home. And uh, we want to thank you so much for this opportunity you have created for all of us to gather around your world from all over the world. I want to pray especially for my brothers and sisters who have sacrificed their sleep, set their sleep aside for the purpose of feeding on your truth with your children. I pray for a special blessing for them. As you said, that those who thirst for righteousness, those who seek truth, that they will be satisfied. Satisfy them just as much as you satisfy us over here. And Father, cause us to concentrate on the teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit. This is my prayer in Christ's name. Amen. The dual beast, the dual beast of the great tribulation, the dual beast of the great tribulation, that's, this, we're now in part two of this uh, chapter, uh, the beast of the land, the beast of the land. We, we looked at the beast of the, the sea uh, when we, in our last study. We picked up here the beast of the land. 
Uh, I want you to keep in mind that this chapter we are looking at here is a chapter that is characterized by deception. It is a chapter of deception. Uh, Satan, Satan's true color to portray himself as the God of the universe will, it will shine more and more as we look at the, this chapter. Remember what Satan has been trying to do all along? Satan has been trying to show himself to be the true God. In fact, in heaven, before he was dethroned, he wanted to, he wanted to usurp God and his authority and assume the throne that belongs to the God Almighty. So Satan has been seeking worship. He's been seeking, he's been dreaming that one day, one day, he will dethrone God. One day, he will put God out of his throne and then take that throne and be the God of the universe. So in this chapter, as we are, as we are, uh, we are in the middle of the tribulation, we, we're going to see another trick, what Satan will play at this uh, particular time. As we have read this uh, from verses 11 through 18, we're going to see his true color in this chapter. He will deceive many who do not have love, who do not have a love for the truth. As, as the Bible tells us in, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, first of all, God will give them over. One thing you don't want in your life as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ is for God to give you over. You do not want for God to turn his back on you. You don't want as a believer for God to say, that's it, I'm done with you. If he does, there is no turning back. Uh, you can just put it this way, you are finished as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so in his mercy, in his grace, he will continue to extend uh, ample time, even when we fail in our spiritual lives, he will continue to give us I would say, call it long rope for us to return back to him. But when we keep becoming uh, negative to his call of grace, eventually that long rope will be exhausted and God will have no recourse but to either turn us over to our desires and lock us there and we'll be locked up in that state and that's it. And we will, we, will be, we will slide from that point until we hit the dead end of sin unto death. And we will be removed from this world into eternity, completely and totally empty, empty handed. As Paul says, you will be like someone who simply had escaped fire. You'll be like someone who somehow escaped burning fire. All, all you, everything was caught, your clothes, everything was uh, caught in the fire or in a fire. And then uh, you just managed to escape with few uh, burning and, and that's just about it. And so as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, again, uh, let us not continue in the, in, a, in the negative mode whereby God continues to deal with us and eventually gives us over. Because what we're going to see here is that the people who will be sucked in into this pipeline of deception are people who have, for many, God has, even in the tribulation, he has given them even more time and they kept saying no, 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 no to the truth. And let us not join them now. If, if, if you keep saying no, no, no to God's uh, exhortation, admonition, eventually he will just 
turn his back on you. According to Romans chapter 1, and as we see it in 2 Thessalonians, where we read last week. So Satan wants to portray himself as a member of unholy trinity. Uh, unholy trinity. So we're going to look at unholy trinity. We know about trinity. Remember what I said when it comes to identifying counterfeit. Don't spend your time because there are many counterfeits. Spend your time in the truth. Dig in, to, to dig in day in and day out. Study truth from every angle. Once you master truth, people will come with all kinds of falsehoods. You can spot falsehood from a distance. Even if it comes with uh, miracles and signs and wonders, because you know what the Bible says, you know what the truth says, you cannot be deceived. Even when somebody is re referring to the Bible itself, because you have been grounded and rooted in truth, you cannot be deceived. And so, unholy trinity. One, let's look at unholy trinity. We, 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 you and I, we know holy trinity, and we understand the triunion God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, let's, look, let's look at Satan as he will try to mimic by deception, counterfeit Holy Trinity. One, the dragon is anti-God. The dragon is anti-God, the Father. He's anti-God, the Father. That means he represents false Father. Remember in the Trinity, we have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So this chapter 13 is going to present this unholy trinity, working together in a camouflaged manner, in a deceptive uh, way to portray themselves as a triunion God, but in this case, false trinity, false trinity, unholy trinity. Two, the sea, the sea beast is anti-God the Son. The sea beast is anti-God the Son. That means the sea beast, which one we studied it last, last uh, week, portrays himself as God the Son, as the second member of the Trinity. Trinity. But in this case, second member of the unholy Trinity. We are looking at unholy trinity. See, Satan always tries to duplicate whatever God brings forth. We, we saw it even in miracles. In the time of Moses in Egypt, Moses performed miracle and the, and, and the, the people working for Pharaoh will come and duplicate Moses' miracle. Whatever Moses did, they duplicated until there was a distinction. Moses did one, they couldn't duplicate. And they came to the conclusion, this is in the hand of man. This is the hand of God. They don't know what God, but it's the hand of God, some God. The sea beast again is anti-God, representing the second member of the unholy God. What about the land sea? And I, I already know you know what the land sea represents. The land sea represents the holy, anti Holy Spirit, anti Holy Spirit, portraying himself as the third member of the unholy Trinity. Unholy Trinity. In light of this ultimate deception, we'll break our study into four parts. Let's examine this section we are going to study. I have broken it into four parts. One, the first part, introduction of the second beast in verse 11. Introduction of the second beast. Yeah. This section begins with the introduction of the second beast. This second beast is the beast that portrays himself as we, as in our own case, Holy Spirit, 
but the unholy spirit, unholy spirit. 11, verse 11. John begins this verse, and I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon. I saw, John now sees, uh, the scene has moved as John is focusing, uh, this, the scene of this chapter is all, on, it's not in heaven anymore. John is now seeing what is happening on earth. And he sees this beast coming from the land. The last of last week came from the, from the sea, but this one from the land. And, and the, I want you to mark one, mark a word that we see in that verse. And that word is the word another, another. And that word another is very significant. You see, remember when we talk about the Trinity, when we talk about the Trinity, we always talk about uh, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit coexisted in eternity past, co-equal, co-infinite, and co-internal. Uh, they, they, they share the same essence. They share the same essence. So you can, the, the Father is not the Son, and the Son is not the Holy Spirit. The, the Father is different from the Son in that the Father is spirit. And the Son is not. And the Son is different from the Holy Spirit in that the Holy Spirit is spirit. And so when we look at all this, we see that they, they have similarities. And that's what Satan is going to portray here. He's going to portray him being the father of this unholy triunion uh, God, on the Holy Triunion God, him being the father. Uh, we always say uh, Jesus in, in, in John chapter 10, verse 30, uh, we, in John 10, 30, we see the similarity between the father and the son, where he says that Jesus said, I and the father are one. One in similarity, one in essence, but different in, uh, in, in, in personality. Different in personality. So that's what we're going to be, what I'm saying with that word another. That word another in the Greek is a word that means one of the same kind. One of the same kind. Jesus himself said, used that word when he was speaking to his disciples. I said, I'll go to the father. I will ask him to send you another, another. In other words, one of the same kind, similar to me in every respect. And so we see here, and he had in verse 1, 11 again, and I saw another beast, which means he has resemblance to the beast that we studied last week. Out of the coming out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon. He had two horns representing, portraying himself as a gentle lamb. Two, two, two horns as a lot of a lamb, as someone who is gentle, portraying his gentility. But he gives himself, he gives himself his true identity through his speech by what he says and what he does, especially what he says. Uh, and he spoke as a dragon in verse 11. And he spoke as a dragon. He presents himself as a kind Holy Spirit, gentle. But he, his speech, as a dragon, what does he mean he speaks like a dragon? Well, how does dragon Satan, how does he speak? He speaks arrogantly, prideful, 
I want to be like God, or boastful, boastfulness. That's Satan. So when the, the true Holy Spirit never boasts, there is nothing, you cannot see anything. We'll come to that in a, in a minute. When it comes to the Holy Spirit, if the co-equal, co-infinite, co-internal with the Son, and yet he, he become obedient or subjected himself to the authority of the Son. Because it, when the, Jesus said when he comes, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will take the things that belong to me and give it to you. When the Holy Spirit comes, he will glorify me. Uh, Jesus, go if quarrel with the Father, glorified the Father. And so here, in the beast trying to portray himself as the third member of the Trinity, showed himself as one who is very gentle. But when he speaks, you know exactly what comes out of him. And uh, that uh, just, that pause reminds me of where we always hear people say that by their fruit, you will know them. Haven't you heard that? By their fruit, you will know them. In other words, people say that the only way you find out who is a true believer is by the person's attitude, how the person lives, how the person communicates, how the person does things, then you know he's a Christian or not. Not so fast. In fact, in the world of deception, camouflage, you can hardly know a Christian by his or her action. Unbelievers often display extraordinary moral, moral life. Unbelievers, there are some more unbelievers that are more moral than believers themselves. Does that make them, able, does that make them believers? Of course not. Uh, but uh, let, let me pause here and, and, and tell you, turn with me. We have read this passage many times. Many of us have no clue of what the Bible is saying. Jesus Christ says something in Matthew chapter 7. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 7. In verse 15, he says, Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but on inwardly are ravenous wolves. These, these are wolves, but they put on sheep clothing. That means outward appearance, outward appearance. You can have someone in the church who manifests all the signs of Christianity, but is not a Christian. You sing, he sings. He, you dance, he dance. He walks all kinds of way, walking so humbly. And you say that this individual is no other than a Christian. And that's the type of Jesus is saying, beware of this kind of deception. A wolf camouflages with sheep clothing. In other words, a wolf among sheep cannot be identified by observation by observation, because they are mingling with the same uh, sheep clothing and that you cannot by sight know. So that's why Jesus is putting that one. He said, you will know them by their fruits. You stop right there. You will know them by their fruits. How would you know a sheep that is um, a wolf that has camouflaged like a sheep? How do you know? By their fruit. What fruit here? Uh, if people, if you use this as outward manifestation, you will fail the test of scripture. Because everybody, people can camouflage. I told, I told us one time there when I'm back home 
in, in my country, Nigeria, uh, there was a man who came to church, unbeliever, acted like a believer, did everything. He saw a lady he wanted to marry. And knowing that to marry this lady, he must be a member of that church. He became a member, baptized, did everything. Did, I was there, got married with, uh, by pastor's recommendation. That week after marriage, he never returned back to church. The church he's been going, coming every three, four, five times a week. He stopped and he told his wife, he wasn't a believer. He just came because he, he was attracted to him. So that's it. People can do all kinds of things. Don't be deceived. And so, but the question arises, how then do you know a person who you cannot identify by appearance? You look at their Jehovah Witnesses, for example. They are so, many of them are very moral, very honest, very, very outgoing, very uh, kind and all kinds of things. Whatever you can find from that list of by their fruit, you know them, you find them there. But how do you know that a Jehovah Witness is not among us or a Mormon is not among us? Not by the action, but by their words. Turn with me to Je Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. In Matthew chapter 12, Jesus then explains exactly what he meant when he's talking about making, knowing them by their fruit. In verse 33, Matthew 12, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For the tree is known by its fruit. Keep reading. You brood, brood of vipers, how can you be in evil? You, you getting it? How can you be in evil speak what is good? That's the key. For the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. You got it? the mouth. Now, this is how you know who is a Christian or who belong, the mouth. What comes out of it, the mouth, verse 36. And I say to you that every careless word that men shall speak, they shall render a account for it in that day of judgment. For by your words, you got it, you shall be justified. And by your words, you shall be condemned. By your words, you'll be identified who you are. When I speak with a Jehovah Witnesses person, <laughs> all he, the person has to do is answer my few questions. Right there and then I will know that this person doesn't belong to us. Who is Jesus? The answer I get tells me that this person is not part of us. I ask the same question to a Mormon. Who is Jesus? A Mormon will tell me that Jesus is one of us. We, we, we're going to go to heaven and we'll be, we'll be there will be God and goddesses in heaven. That tells me right there and then that this person doesn't belong to us. But by observation, no. But by words, the same thing when you are with, with someone who can camouflage. And that's what John is telling us here. He pretends, he wears that garment of, of being a wolf in a sheep clothing, but his word gave him up. His word gave him up. So it is very important that we know this truth and arm ourselves with the truth so that we will not be deceived. This brings us to the second point, imitation of the Holy, of the Holy Spirit, imitation of the Holy Spirit, verses 12 and 13. On Holy, in this case, on the Holy Spirit. On the Holy Spirit. Verse 12. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast. He, he is the second beast. Exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence. 
And he makes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast, whose fatal wound was healed. The fatal wound of the first beast represents the wound that Jesus Christ sustained, even his death. Because this first beast is a, a, is a, a first son of God, a first son of God, uh, a first uh, son of unholy God, unholy father. Uh, he was wounded the same way the son of God was wounded to the point of death. And we saw in our study last time, he was healed the same way the son of God was healed. So you see what the devil is trying to do here to show people who have been looking, the people who will be sucked into this most, mostly will be the Jewish kingdom because they have been waiting for the Messiah. And remember what Jesus said in John 5, 43, I have come, I have demonstrated to you that I'm the Messiah, you rejected me. One will come in his name and you will accept him. You will believe in him. And this is what is happening here. One has come in his name. The dragon has come, portraying himself as the true God of the universe. Uh, and he's portraying himself, uh, the son, uh, the son of God is a teaching of the Old Testament. In Psalm, uh, the Jews, they have concept of the Messiah, God's son. So here now he's portraying himself. Watch, I was wounded. And now I am healed. And people are watching all this. People are seeing this and saying, this is remarkable. This is marvelous. This is great. God has come in the flesh. Really. Deception. Deception. And so, imitation of the Holy, Sp uh, Holy Spirit, which is on the Holy Spirit, uh, as the work of the Holy Spirit is to promote Christ, the land beast, the land beast will promote the sea beast who portrays himself as the son of God. Look at John, turn back to John chapter 16. Let's look at what the Holy Spirit does for Christ. John 16, verse 13 and 14. Jesus speaking about the Holy Spirit says, but when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth for he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will disclose to you what is to come. Verse 14, he shall glorify me, you see? He shall glorify me. The work of the Holy Spirit is to glorify the Son. Exactly what the unholy spirit is doing here, glorifying the beast from the sea who claims to be Antichrist, this, the son of the unholy God, the son of the unholy God. You see, all you see here is deception, deception, and people will buy into it. People will buy into it. Now we looked at, let's take a little bit uh, step, turn to uh, the great deception, that's number three the third part of our study, the great deception, verses 14 and 15. The great deception, verses 14 and 15. Back again in verse 12, and he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence, and he makes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose fatal wound has been healed. Again, he is pointing, he's not drawing attention to himself, but he's pointing and drawing attention to the 
unholy son of the unholy father. Uh, so that people will worship him, pointing to what has been transpired in his life. Watch, see, he was wounded, but now he's back to life. Pulling people in verse 13. And he performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down out of heaven to the earth in the presence of men, in the presence of men. He did all kinds of things to convince people that the one that he is pointing to them is the true son of God, the true Messiah, if you would. And he will back it with signs and wonders. He will perform miracles. Uh, this, uh, of course, a warning to those who worship miracles. Satan will, uh, the second beast, or the, the third beast, or the second beast, actually, we have two beasts, dragon being the one in the middle as the father. The second beast will perform miracles, even calling fire, like Elijah did. Elijah told the first prophets, uh, call, let fire come and uh, consume your sacrifice. Whomever fire comes from heaven, that individual is representing the true God. And this beast is going to do the same thing. He's going to call fire. And people will be seeing these spectacular things happening as he will just call or speak, fire come down from heaven and fire will come boom. Whether it's to consume a, a place or to do something, people will say, this is spectacular. This is the work of God. Like they did in the time of Elijah. They started hearing, the first prophets have started hearing, your God is the true God. They bowed immediately before this great sign. And this is what is going to happen. Deception, the heart of deception. Uh, some Christians who are misguided, there are some Christians, misguided Christians, I call them mis misguided Christians. Some, this is what they, they say, I quote, they say, you can really know where God is and where his power is by signs and wonders. Did you hear what they say? You can really know where God is. In other words, the only way to find out where God is really uh, in, 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 in the midst of people is where you have signs and wonders. In other words, if you don't have, I have heard uh, people in my travels, they say that, well, we can't, uh, uh, we don't have, uh, uh, we're not doing well in our church because we, are not, we don't have signs and wonders. We need, to, we need to do some miracles in our church in order to do well. That the, the mark of a living church is signs and wonders. And I say to that kind of statement, wrong, falsehood. The sign of God's presence in a congregation, in a church, the sign of God's presence in that community of believers is love. Love, you hear me? Love, not miracles, not science. That doesn't mean that God doesn't do miracles. He does miracles every time. Miracles have not ended. He, God still does miracles, but at will. We no longer have people to command God to do miracles, like in the days of the apostles. In the days of the apostles, that's very unique. God gave that to, to them that ability as a badge of recognition, who is truly an apostle. Paul used that badge to defend his apostleship to the Corinthians. He told them, am I not true an am I not true apostle? Have I not performed signs and wonders? So if everybody could perform signs and wonders, why did Paul use that as a badge of his, of his defense as an apostle? Not everybody. When, when Docas died, there were many believers in town. They had to call Peter, who lived about 12 miles away, to come and see if he can perform miracle. And he did perform miracle. When Paul was preaching, somebody died, fell off from the window and, and died. Well, there were people who were at the back of the seat, who could have exited, who could have gone through the exit and gone down 
and brought him, this young man back to life. No, nope. Paul had to come from the front where he was teaching and walk all the way to the back, exit, went downstairs and brought this person back. That's the work of an apostle. A badge of recognition. And Satan now is going to display this to draw attention to people to worship the false Christ, the antichrist. This is very fascinating, very fascinating. But when we, when we arm ourselves with the truth as believers, we will not be deceived. We will not be deceived. Again, the true sign of a living church is love. Jesus said, love one another. By this, you will know, outside us, we know that you are my disciples. If you love one another, that's the sign of a living church, love. I don't care what miracles that is performed. If it doesn't jive with love, we are wasting time. And people are buying into miracles today. And millions are deceived worldwide. Christians even are sucked in into the pipeline of this deception. Miracle, miracle. If you, the devil is so, so shrewd. If he knows that you are one of those into miracle pursuit, he will begin to trick you. And then you begin to question the truth of the scripture. That's, what, that's his aim, to make you to question God's word. Turn to Deuteronomy. Even in the Old Testament, God warned about this first teaching. In Deuteronomy chapter 13, let's look at the first five verses. God speak to speak. God spoke through Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 13 about first first miracles. Even in the Old Testament, there was warning about first miracles. Verse 1. If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder comes true. You see, the issue is not whether you come through or not. It can perform a miracle and it's true miracle, as many people often tell me. I saw it, it was genuine, it was real. I'm not doubting you. Look at God himself speaking here. Concerning which he spoke to you saying, let us go after other gods whom you have not known and let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of the prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God is testing you to find out if you love the Lord you are God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall follow the Lord your God and fear him, and you shall keep his commandments, listen to his voice, serve him and cling to him. But that prophet or that dreamer or dreams of dreams shall be put to death because he has counseled rebellion against the Lord your God who brought you out of the land. You see what is happening here, don't you? A prophet. He said, by their words, you will know the true prophet. He has performed a miracle. It happened. He has even uh, declared what will happen tomorrow. It did happen. But what his words is portraying is the true nature of that prophet. The same way we see it all over the world today. And the Bible is warning us to stay clear of such path. And sometimes God can trick, God can test you, as he says here. You know what the truth is? And he's going to test you to see whether you subscribe to the miracle or you subscribe to the truth. Which one, we, which one, you see, that's why you do not, write this down, we do not use experience to interpret scripture. We do not use experience to interpret scripture, real or imagined. When you begin to use experience to interpret scripture, scripture will no longer be valid to you. In other words, I don't care whether you speak, somebody speaks and the fire comes from heaven or something comes, 
you don't use that to interpret scripture. Whereby it contradicts scripture, push it out because the devil is at work, even as I speak. Back, uh, turn to Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, the same thing, Matthew 7, 21, because our time is drawing near. In Matthew 7, 21, 23, Jesus spoke about prophets who perform miracles, who will come to him on that day and claim, Lord, Lord, did we not perform miracles in your name? He will deny them. They will spend eternity in the lake of fire. They have their miracles were valid. He didn't deny they didn't perform miracle, but he said you did all these things, but we have no relationship. And then in, in, in Matthew 24, 24, Jesus said the same thing. Be mindful of false prophets who will perform miracles. And they, also in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9. And, and back to our back to our text in, in Revelation chapter 13. It's very, very fascinating when you see the truth coming, coming and glaring at you. And verse 13 again, and he performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down out of heaven to the earth in the presence of men. Verse 14, and he deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs which it was given him to perform in the presence of the beast telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who lay, who had the wound of the sword and has come to life. You see, now make the, make a, uh, there will be a clear mark of, hey, let's make a beast. Uh, let's make a beast. In, in making of this beast, in the left side, make, a, make an idol. They're going to make an idol in honor of the Son of God, the, the first Son of Unholy God. And, and that image is what Jesus Christ and Daniel, Daniel spoke about that in Daniel chapter, seven, uh, chapter 9, verse 27. The, the Lord also spoke about it in Matthew 24, 15. The, uh, the, and Paul in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, uh, verse th uh, 2 and 3. Uh, the Lord caused it, the desolate of abomination uh, that we sit in the temple and uh, requiring worship. But what's interesting here, what's interesting here, even it has, it has caused many scholars uh, to lose hair over what it meant is uh, go, go look at verse 15. And there was given to him to give breath, breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast might even speak and cause as many as do not worship the image of the beast to be killed, that the image will even speak that the image will speak. Well, when we look at the, the scripture, uh, the Bible tells us in Psalm, in Psalm 135, verse 15. So you can say speaking idol or idol that speaks. In Psalm 135, verse 15 and 16, Psalm, the psalmist says that idols don't speak. The idols are but woods, man-made things, they don't speak. But this one is a unique one. Some scholars have said maybe it's robot, maybe it's <laughs> people. When people see robot, they will know robot. But what's going to happen here is dramatic uh, and something extraordinary, designed to cause people to sway away and worship, compared to worship Satan. Uh, 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 from from my knowledge of scripture, from what I what I see in the past, I, I can almost say that God is signing off on this spectacular thing. Uh, how do I how do I come to that conclusion? In Second Thessalonians, where we read, read it again, chapter two, God said, 
because you do not you do not love the truth he will give you over to deception by giving you over god will do all kinds of things to lure you to enter into that room that you have been desiring to do you don't want me there cannot be neutrality if you don't want me i am going to compel you to go into that room which you have been desiring to go if you want you don't want me one in one day first first uh, god satan himself dragon to dragon you will go you don't want to go i will compel you to go if it requires miracles i will you've been wanting miracles now you get miracles it's going to be a very uh, it's going to be a, a terrible time in history and this brings us to mark of the beast mark of the beast marks of the beast one, they are the same, but differ in origin. We're looking at the marks that the, these two beasts possess. One, they are the same, but differ in origin. Two, one comes from the sea. One comes from the sea. Three. The order comes from the land. The order comes from the land. Four, like the Holy Spirit is subordinate to Christ, the land beast would be subordinate to the sea beast, as we saw in verse 12. Again, like the Holy Spirit is subordinate to the to Christ, the land beast would be subordinate to the the sea beast. I'm sorry, the land beast would be subordinate to the sea beast. Five. The land beast will cause the whole world to worship the sea beast. The land beast will cause the whole world to worship the beast six they are different in appearance the land beast has two horns they are different in appearance so as believers as we conclude this uh, the, the 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 essence when when we come to to, to the the max of the beast just getting the, the we're just getting we have seen the similarities and that's the fourth part we've seen the similarities but we're going to see that mark being portrayed into having identity which we in verses uh, 16 through 18 which comes to a number that the people living in that time must have, must be forced to have. Verse 16, and the earth, uh, verse 16, I'm sorry. Verse 16, and he causes all the small and the great and the rich and the poor and the free men and the slaves to be given a mark on their right hand or on their forehead to be given a mark. You must have a mark. Well, what do we know about mark? Back in chapter 11, God gave the saints mark, gave 144,000 mark, which kept them from destruction. Ah, Satan is going to duplicate the same thing. He's going to give mark the same way God did. He's always going after whatever God did. To counterfeit it, he will give them mark in verse either in their forehead or in their hand. And he verse seventeen, and he provides that no one should be able to buy or sell except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. Scholars, Bible students. 
they have been trying to decode what the name, what that number is, what the not, who could that number be applied to? Some have said maybe to Pope, to Emperor, to uh, all kinds of, uh, uh, no, don't, don't, don't decode. Don't spend your time trying to decode what does 666 mean? As a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, don't, don't, don't spend your time in those things. It, it doesn't do you any good. What, but what, it, what, is, what is clear from the scripture is that there will be a mark in verse 18. That mark is 666. Here is wisdom. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding <coughs> calculate the number of the beast. For the number of that of a man and the number is 666. That is 666. That is the number that would be stamped, marked. We don't know how that will be done. Uh, some people have suggested uh, uh, implanting of a chip, microchip implant. <coughs> whatever means, whatever way it would be done, the Bible didn't tell us. But what we know is that Satan would be, uh, people living on that particular time of tribulation would be forced to have this number. And you may ask a question, what about believers? There's, there will still be believers at that time. Would they have these numbers? No, they have already been sealed in the blood of Christ by their faith in Christ alone. They will not ask how would they buy and sell and eat? And that's a good question. And the answer is also a good one. God will see to it that he provides for his own, no matter the circumstance even in a place where evil reigns. God will see to it that he takes care of his own. That's his character by providence. The same way he provided for Elijah, uh, where no food was around, he took care of his own. God, in his character, in his faithfulness, will always do that. Uh, he did that in the past, in, in the wilderness. When, when Israel ran away in the wilderness, there was no food, no grocery store, no, no, no water, by the way, no stream, nothing, dry land, God provided. He's <coughs> faithful. He never fails. And that can give us comfort. The same way he provides in the past, he's providing today, that you have no cause to panic about the future. So long as you, as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, is advancing in your spiritual life, applying the truth that you are learning on a daily basis consistently, I guarantee you, God will not let you down. He will provide even when all doors are closed, even when people have forsaken and turned their backs on you. God will not. He will provide for his own. He will shelter his own, even in calamities. He said it in very well in Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 12 through 14, or even beyond. If there is a famine in the land, if I cut off beasts and animals, if these men were in that place, in that environment, he named them Job, he named them Daniel, Noah. And these people we know very well. God said, by their own righteousness, they will be safeguarded. That is the character of God. As we come here, like I said, people today are afraid. People are concerned. They said, well, some believers said, we, is, this, is this number they are using now? Is it 666? I don't want to be identified. There are Christians today that are very fearful about being identified with uh, the, the beast, the mark of the beast. I got good news for you. Fear thou not, you shouldn't fear because that number is not here present. The, the number is not here, it's not here. How do we know? I know because of the sequence of events. One, the rapture will take place first. The rapture will take place first. The reason why you and I are still here is because the rapture hasn't taken place. If we miss the rapture, then we are in tribulation. And if we're in tribulation, we're in trouble. The rapture hasn't taken place. Secondly, the Antichrist will be manifested. He'll be revealed. 
He hasn't come yet. He may still be, he may, he may already be born right now because we don't know when the rapture will occur. The rapture can occur tonight and then tomorrow he will be revealed. He may, he may still be already wandering around. We don't know. But the rapture will be taking place. Secondly, the Antichrist will be revealed. Then the number will now be introduced. So a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you, are not, you cannot be associated with the number. If you have put your trust in Christ, you will definitely and you will definitely be raptured taken out of this world when the trumpet, according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, sounds. That's our hope. That's our confidence. We're not here just to be here. We are here because we are being kept by the power of our God. And so don't worry about decoding the number. People have, I read a lot of commentaries. People spend time trying to, maybe this number four, five, in the Roman time, five, uh, seven, maybe the number, I don't spend time. I like what uh, Dr. McGee said, and I will quote him as we close this message. Dr. G. McGee said it very well. He said, I would suggest, Bonnie McGee, I would suggest that we not waste our time trying to identify a person by this number. Instead, we need to present Jesus Christ that we might reduce the population of those who have to go through the great tribulation period and who will therefore know what the number of the beast is. I like that, end of quote. In other words, the people who will know the exact meaning of that number, who will know to whom it belongs, there will be people in the great tribulation, not us. Like, the, like Dr. McGee said, let's spend our time preaching the gospel that many will escape the great tribulation. And let us continue to advance in the learning of this great book for blessing comes. I can see why God said blessings are those who partake in the learning and application of the book of Revelation. Uh, I want to thank you for taking the time, especially for those Right now is three in the morning and they're still awake, learning the word of God. You really cause tears in my soul as I think of the sacrifice you make because of your love for the word of God. As we bow our heads now, I call upon my brother again, perhaps to close us in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the word that has come for we thank you for your truth, which is our guide, which is our reality, which points us to the right direction in righteousness. We thank you because we cannot do without your truth. Your truth is what reveals to us who you are. It dissects, or dissects for us the lies and removes the lies from all our lives. Thank you, Father, as we continue to study your word, may we become more and more like Christ. May we continue to function by your spirit. May our spiritual life continue to boom more and more. We thank you for our pastor who continues to teach this word to us. And we thank you for the blessings that come upon us as we study this book of Revelation. Challenge us with your truth, Father, we ask you. Continue to guide and support us in all we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. And uh, you all enjoy the rest of your morning and the rest of your night. Until next time. Goodbye.